The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you are joining this webinar. This is Scott Anthony from Insight. We're about to start navigating Innovation's first mile. We'll just wait a, a minute or two for our late arrivers to join, and then we will dive into the material here. So just hold on for about 60 or 90 seconds, and we'll get started. All right, it's showing 902 here in our Asia Pacific headquarters in Singapore. A little bit of a gray, cloudy day here, but we're going to get started with today's webinar where I'm going to share some of the latest insights from my recently released book, The First Mile. So this is me talking. You see my picture on the screen, Scott Anthony. I'm Inisight's managing partner. For those of you who don't know Inisight, very briefly, Inisight is a professional services company, primarily a management consulting company. It helps large companies deal with some of the challenges of innovation and growth. We also, through our arm in Singapore, have a venture capital investing arm where we provide seed capital to early stage startups. And what I'm going to do during the course of today's webinar is summarize some of the observations and lessons that we've learned as we've helped both big and small companies try to go through this magic moment that I call the first mile of innovation. Now we're going to try to make today's session as interactive as possible. So we're going to have a couple poll questions and pause a couple times for you to ask me questions so we can engage in a dialogue together. Feel free at any point during the webinar to type in a question in the panel box that you've got in the GoToMeeting control panel. And I'll make sure that my team feeds the best questions to me as we get to the couple of places where we're going to pause and get into a discussion. So let's dive in. One of the big things that you consistently observe about innovation is it's something that people really struggle with. Even though everybody today knows that innovation is critically important, only about one in five executives believe the way that they are approaching innovation is delivering a real competitive advantage. So we'd love to hear from you about the specific innovation challenge that your organization is facing. Is it developing ideas, securing funding and leadership support, getting the right talent and resources, or commercializing and scaling ideas? Give us your input, and we'll see how it compares to other people to whom we've asked this question. All right, so we've got the answers on the screen here. Interestingly, securing funding and leadership support has come up as the, the number one response here with close to 40%. Uh, this compares to about 25% in a recent survey that we did of the readers of our strategy and innovation publication. The next most common answer, which is really the focus of the discussion today, is commercializing and scaling ideas. About a third of people said this, compared to 40% in our overall survey. Developing ideas came in third at 19% compared to 11% in our survey, and talent and resources came in at 9% as opposed to 16% in our survey. It's an interesting observation because if you observe where people actually spend their time, a lot of the time, particularly inside large companies, is on the first area, trying to develop ideas. And what I'm going to talk about here is really zeroing in on that moment where you go from developing an idea to seeking to commercialize it. This is what I call the first mile of innovation, where you step from plan on paper to the often harsh reality of the marketplace. I should note on the slide here you can see my Twitter handle, at Scott D. Anthony. If there is anything you hear in this webinar that you'd like to tweet out, either during the webinar or after, please feel free to do so, and certainly reference the first mile and to me as well. So the first mile can be an absolutely exhilarating place. This is a picture of me living in innovation's first mile. 
I was in an enclosed space in Bangalore, a city of about 6 million people in India. A stranger who spoke no English was pressing a blade against my neck, and I was loving it. You see, I was in the field testing an idea that our team had been working on called Razor Rave. The idea was to bring a novel solution to the men's grooming market in India, haircuts, shaves, and so on. If you went to the market at the time, you'd see that there weren't very many good solutions. At the high end, you had great salons at six-star hotels, but those were really expensive. Most people in India either had to go to relatively dingy barber shops, or they went to something like this that you see on your screen now, a chair on the side of the road where you closed your eyes and hoped that the barber had recently washed his equipment. Of course, this was incredibly cheap, but it wasn't a particularly good solution. So our idea was to come in right between these two extremes. We come up with something that was a high quality solution, but develop an innovative business model that would allow us to develop it or deliver it at relatively low cost. Is anybody going to actually go for this idea? Who knows? So we began to test it. The first test you see pictured here. This is the Razor Rave truck that we drove around the streets of Bangalore in 2008. This wasn't just rolling advertisement for the idea. This truck was actually hollowed out. There was a barber chair in the back of it. The question was, would anyone in their right mind get into the back of a truck where a stranger with a blade awaited? It turned out people would. People were really interested in the concept. So we took the next step, going from the idea that we had in a business plan to actually going out to field test the business model that we had formulated. That's where I came into the picture. I was in, uh, inside the kiosk that you see pictured on the left side of your screen here. You see, our idea to come up with a way to disrupt this market was to create a very low overhead single chair model. It was portable, it was low cost, it was incredibly efficient. If we could find a way through each of these kiosks to even get about 12 customers a day, we could cover our overhead. Our business plan suggested that we can build thousands of these across India and come up with a model that created a lot of economic value for us. So there I was in the field in 2009, testing, feeling, living in innovation's first mile, and truly loving it. The first mile, again, can be an exhilarating place. A few months after this, I remained optimistic about the business. Here's an email that I sent one of my colleagues describing why I believed in Razor Ray. It started with a pretty simple but true observation. There's a lot of hair in India. Now, I did go a little bit deeper than this to note that there was a real gap in the marketplace, and there were other people circling around it as well, publicly traded companies that had reasonable valuation in the United States, and people like Gillette, who had made an acquisition with a similar sort of business also in North America, suggesting there might be a way for us to take this really novel concept, begin to develop it throughout India, and have attractive options to make good money on it. I sent this email in January. Four months later, Razor Rave was put down. The first mile is a perilous place as well. What went wrong? Well, it turned out as we got in the field and began testing our idea, there was a fatal flaw in our business model. The thing that made the entire model work was the notion of the single chair kiosk. But that created a problem that we had not anticipated. I called it later the hero barber problem. To even get a dozen customers a day, the barber had to be a hero. They had to develop a following. They had to develop repeat customers. Once the barber, however, knew that they were the hero, then their wage demands began to come in. So we had a catch-22. If we were going to hit our revenue targets, our costs would be too high and we couldn't make profits. If we were going to have a business that had a chance of being profitable with a low-cost barber, there was no way that we could actually hit our revenue targets. Because the barber knew they were the hero in the system. So if we didn't meet their wage demands, they would walk. They'd just go to another barbershop, take their customers with them, and we'd be back to square one. So unfortunately, we put Razor Rave down. Now, of course, some good things happened from this. We learned a ton, which helped inform efforts that we did in other businesses. But this really reinforced to us a general lesson about innovation. The popular symbol for innovation is Edison's light bulb. That's the thing that you always connote with innovation. And far too many people spend all of their effort trying to come up with a perfect idea. 
forgetting even the guy behind the light bulb once said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. There is no perfect idea. Every idea, and I mean every idea, is partially right and partially wrong. What you have to do is figure out ways that you can perspire productively. If you want to get a more recent inspiration behind this idea that the only way you find success is through active learning, we might look at the great American philosopher, actor, and occasional boxer Mike Tyson, who once said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. The reality is the successful businesses weren't successful because the entrepreneur or innovator had a perfect idea from the beginning. The ones that succeed take their punches, course correct, and find a way to ultimately succeed. The reality is for any idea, there are three stages in the life of that idea. Steve Blank, the great thought leader and serial entrepreneur, notes how a startup business is something unique. It is a temporary organization that is in search of a scalable business model. So you do have this one part of the life of an idea where you're in search mode. You start as a green circle with lots of unknowns, and you begin to learn more, turning those green unknowns into blue realities. At some point, everything clicks. You know what success looks like. Generally speaking, you pass three tests. The customers love what you're doing. They're telling other people about it. You can deliver it reliably. You know how to beat the competition consistently. And importantly, you know how to make money. Even if you're not making money now, you've got a clear view for how you can create a profitable business. That's when you stop the experimentation and you begin to scale your business. The third thing, and what we're going to really focus on for the rest of this webinar, is that first step. When you go from that plan, dripped with assumptions, to begin to breathe life into your idea. Now, we've spent a lot of time living in this first mile of innovation. We've invested through our investment arm in nine different companies in Singapore. We've evaluated close to 400 business plans. We've incubated our own businesses through the years. We have a lot of firsthand experience doing it and, of course, advising large companies as well. Through it, we've learned a lot of the pitfalls that exist in the first mile. Now, there are too many for me to recount during our time together today, but I really wanted to zero in on the two most critical ones before I talk about what you can do to overcome the uncertainty that will always characterize a new idea. And to hit these two points, I'm going to give you two case studies. The first case study is an interesting business that we tried to build to take advantage of an interesting quirk that exists in the global healthcare system. On your screen here, you've got a picture of one of my absolute favorite hospitals in Singapore, Glen Eagles Hospital. The reason why I love this hospital is because it's pretty close to where we live in Singapore. And our third child, Harry, who is hopefully pictured on your screen now, was born in this hospital. Now, if you go to a hospital in Singapore, one of your first observations is how modern the hospitals are. They've got fantastic equipment. The doctors are all trained in some of the very best medical schools in the world. And despite this, the cost of many procedures in Singapore is sharply lower than the same procedure in the United States. So from this, we got an idea a few years ago. You would call this idea today medical tourism. What if, we wondered, we took customers in the United States that were doing something that was an elective procedure, like a knee replacement. And instead of having them do it in a high-cost US hospital, we flew them out to Singapore. They got to go to a great hospital. They got first world treatment. They got to stay in a six-star hotel. And they saved a lot of money as well. When we talked to customers about this, they told us they loved the idea. They were going to sign up for it with absolute certainty. Here's the first lesson you've got to realize in innovation's first mile. Customers lie. They lie all the time. Not because they're bad people, not because they're trying to mislead you, but because we just don't do a good job of predicting what we're going to do when faced with a new idea. Here's how we unfortunately learned this for our medical tourism business. We went to a place in the United States where we figured we'd find a lot of customers, Florida. We went to retirement communities and began running seminars where people could come to learn more about our great medical tourism business. Nobody showed up. It turned out once you're faced with the reality of getting on a plane and flying more than 9,000 miles for an elective procedure, 
saving money doesn't actually look all that exciting. You'll find this again and again when you proceed through innovation's first mile. What customers say and what they do is often distinctly different. So you want to find ways to make your business as real as possible, to learn in a transaction-like environment, because it's only in those environments that you figure out whether you've got something that really clicks with the customer. Let me tell you the second lesson that you'll learn repeatedly as you go through innovation's first mile. This is a, another business idea that we had in India. Village Laundry Service was the name of the business. We were going to disrupt, in this case, the laundry market in India. The middle class in India is booming. You've got people who want to get some of the luxuries that they see on television all around the world, but they haven't historically been able to purchase things like washing machines, dryers, and so on. The best option for the emerging middle class to clean their clothes is to hire the local dobi. It is very affordable, costs about 20 rupees per kilogram of laundry, which is about 30 US cents. It's got some downsides as well. Your clothes are gone for seven to 10 days. They're washed in a communal pool that isn't all that hygienic. They're treated with harsh chemicals, and then they're beaten against rocks to remove stains. So you can see there are some downsides to this solution. Our idea was to come up with this little kiosk here. Yes, you would charge a price premium, 30 rupees, ultimately going up to 60 or 80 rupees, but you give people 24-hour service. You would give them the ability to have access to a great washing machine and dryer, to have someone else still do the work for them, but get much quicker turnaround and much higher quality. This business looked beautiful on paper. We dreamed about spreading it all throughout India, then other similar markets in Southeast Asia, and even the world. People got extremely excited about this concept. It's probably the concept we've worked on that's generated the most interest. We raised more than a million dollars, including some of our own money, to begin to commercialize the idea. We were tabbed one of India's hottest startups. We had 30 of these kiosks all around Bangalore, Mumbai, and Mysore in India. We learned, unfortunately, a painful lesson about innovation's first mile. Remember how beautiful this business looked on paper, how beautiful those spreadsheets were? Unfortunately, you can't cash a spreadsheet. A business that looks beautiful on paper is not the same as a beautiful business. In the case of Village Laundry Service, as we wind back the clock, one of the things that ended up being trouble for the business is we raised so much money. Why is that bad news? Well, we got so excited about expanding the business that we weren't able to learn how to actually make the economic model work. We were so busy fighting fires, literally fighting fires. One of the kiosks caught on fire at one point that we couldn't figure out all the little nitty-gritty details required to make this profitable. Finally, we stepped back and said, you know what? We picked the wrong delivery model. Yes, there's very clearly a market need here, but the kiosk-based model has some real limitations. Today, we have a very different model that we're executing in India, where we've got a central store with an army of drivers that go to people's homes to pick up their clothes. We're still fighting, and we still have some hope that we'll be able to make this work, but because we got fooled by our spreadsheet in the early days of this business, it took us far too long to get to that point. The first mile is a really tough place. Most startup businesses, as I think everybody knows, fail. Most innovation efforts by large companies don't deliver against expectations. That doesn't mean that there is no hope or no reason for optimism. What I'm going to do over the course of the next 15 minutes or so is provide to you our tips about how to approach in a scientific way the uncertainty that always characterizes a new idea. I'm going to ask you to remember two abbreviations, DEFT and HOPE. And as we, after we go through this section of the discussion, I'll pause for a few minutes to get your questions. To try to bring this to life, I'm going to give you another case study from India. It so happens that we've got a lot of India case studies today, which I hope is appropriate, given this is a, a something that is meant to be an Asia-themed discussion today. But what we're going to talk a little bit about is how to drive growth in the pacemaker market in India. The world's leading provider of pacemakers is Medtronic, a company based in Minnesota in the United States, the world's largest independent medical device manufacturer that, if you follow the news, you know just merged with Covidian to become even bigger than it is today. A pacemaker, a device that gets implanted in your chest to regulate the flow of electricity if your heart doesn't work properly, is one of its flagship products. This is a pacemaker being implanted in India. 
historically, this was a very rare sight. Even though India has more heart disease than any country in the world, there weren't very many pacemakers delivered in that country. Why is that? There's at least two reasons. First, India is a market where consumers pay for health care out of their own pockets. Even a basic pacemaker costs about $1,000, US placing it out of reach of most customers. Second, the primary care system in India, where a patient gets diagnosed and then sent to a specialist, doesn't work all that well. So even if someone has conditions that suggest they need a pacemaker, they might not know it. So a few years ago, Medtronic asked us to help them come up with a way to break this market open. We came up with an idea that we ultimately called Healthy Heart for All. The idea was we were going to take some of the problems and address them in very innovative ways. We would come up with diagnostic camps that we could run in rural villages where we could diagnose three or 400 people in a day. We'd come up with new ways for hospitals to provide treatment to people who were seeking a pacemaker. We would do direct-to-consumer marketing. And most critically, we would come up with what we thought was the world's first loan program for an implantable medical device. The idea looked great on paper, but of course they always look great on paper. What do you do to try to manage the uncertainty behind an idea like this? Well, let's walk through those two acronyms. First, DEFT. The D in DEFT stands for document. This is a step that far too many innovators skip. Yes, we all know that paralysis by analysis is bad, but doing without thinking can be equally, if not more, dangerous because you can waste a lot of time and money learning things the world has already discovered. So make sure you take the time to document your idea with a degree of thoroughness. Don't provide a, a PhD thesis level doctoral dissertation on your idea, but try to make sure that you explain what the idea is, how it will work, and what has to happen in order for it to succeed. This was incredibly helpful for the Healthy Heart for All journey because it was quite a complicated idea. And the more you take the time to spell out all the different pieces of the idea, the more you recognize all the things that have to go right in order for your idea to succeed. I mentioned before that we've looked at about 400 different business plans through our Inesight Ventures arm here in Singapore. This is my favorite plan of the five years that I've been out here doing this work. This is a company that we ultimately funded called Wildfire. I'm showing you a small segment of the, of the business plan, but not that small a segment. The entire thing was about 13 pages long. The thing that I liked about this is if you can read the little titles at the top of each of the pages, and we've got the full plan on the companion website to the book, innovationsfirstmile.com, you can see here they described everything, the pain, the solution, the traction they had, the barriers they were going to encounter, and so on. They had facts and figures, but they also had visuals as well and showed some of the early traction they were getting in the marketplace. Make sure you take the time to document your idea because a thorough documentation will help you in everything that follows. The E in depth stands for evaluate. The next thing you want to do is pick up your idea and look at it from a bunch of different angles. You're not really trying to figure out is it a good idea or a bad idea. Rather. You're trying to figure out what is a strength, what is a weakness, what is an uncertainty. One of the simplest ways to do this is to look at the fingerprint of success. Look at the thing that will characterize almost every successful idea. There are a lot of different ways to do this. In our Ventures arm, we've got about a 20-point checklist that we go through that's described in the book. But at the simplest level, any idea that succeeds has to meet three characteristics. First, there has to be a need. In Innosite's language, there has to be an important, unsatisfied job the customer is struggling to get done. Second, you have to have a way to address that need consistently, reliably, against current and potential competitors. Finally, the numbers have to work. There has to be a way to sustainably create and capture value. If you don't meet these three criteria, it is very hard to have a successful business. Even looking at these three questions here began to bring some great, great clarity to the team at Medtronic. Pretty clear that there was a market need. Pretty clear if you could solve it, there would be good economic value to create. But that second area, with a particularly complicated business model, that was a real question. Could we actually do this? 
So even asking these basic questions can begin to bring clarity to the things that you're working on. Now let me say just another word about that third question here, is it worth it? This is an area, particularly if you're in a large company, that you can really blow all of your time trying to answer. You come up with these overly intricate spreadsheets that have all these complicated analyses to try to make the business case that your idea is worth it. Please, spend the time doing this. Spend the time trying to figure out how your idea is going to translate into the creation of value. But make sure as you're doing it, you remember the wise words from this gentleman here, Scott Cook, the founder and still active chairman of the US software company Intuit, who once said, for every one of our failures, we had spreadsheets that looked awesome. Remember, a spreadsheet is nothing more than the mathematical relationships between largely made up assumptions. Do it to understand what assumptions you're making, but don't treat your spreadsheet as truth, or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. The F in the DEFT process stands for focus. Once you've evaluated your idea, you begin to focus in on the most critical uncertainties behind your business. The simplest way that I've found to do this is to use what I call the first mile certainty table. It goes back to those three key questions, and it tries to figure out quickly how confident you can be that you meet each of those hurdles. Let me look just at the top row just to show you an example of this. Is there a need? If a customer says there is a need, you know next to nothing. Remember, people lie all the time. If a customer shows there is a need based on how they're spending their time or where they're spending their money, you begin to get a little bit more confident. If the customer has used your idea, your product or service, and they like it, you feel better. If they've spent money on it, you're getting almost there. If they've done it more than once, you're really close. If they've advocated and they told other people that they love it, well, then you can be confident that you are really addressing a real market need. I find in many cases people make big investment decisions when they're in the red on the first question. Maybe they've gone and created a prototype of their idea in the second question, and they've created a really elaborate spreadsheet for their third question. Try to find ways before you make big investments to run little experiments to push you towards the right of this chart. This gets to the fourth and, in my mind, most important letter in the DEFT process, T, where you're going to test rigorously and adapt quickly. Remember, every idea is partially right and partially wrong. It means it is absolutely critical when you go and run experiments that you follow the patron saint of innovation's first mile, MacGyver. For those of you who don't know the gentleman on your screen here, he was the star of a television program that ran from 1989 to 1992. He was famous for getting out of just about any situation using readily available materials. If you don't know what's right or what's wrong about your idea, you want to follow the same approach when you're testing. You don't want to invest too much. You don't want to take too long. You don't want to build too many fixed costs because it will make it harder for you to adapt once you take those punches from Tyson and figure out how your strategy is wrong. Let me give you a couple more tips about the testing stage. First, you want to find ways that approximate market conditions as much as possible and do it in a way that's quick and gives you lots of room for flexibility. Consider the picture on your screen here. This is a cardboard box, bicycle spoke wire, and a fan. When the Wright brothers built this, which we now would call a wind tunnel in 1901, it was a way for them to test more than 200 different types of wing design in just a couple of months. They got real data that showed most of the assumptions that people who were trying to crack the problem of man flight, that most of the data they had was wrong. You want to ask yourself a question. What is our wind tunnel? How might we run thought experiments or run small tests so that we can learn quickly about our idea? As you do this, try to keep the team working on the idea as small as possible. Jeff Bezos has a rule at Amazon.com. When they're working on great big breakthroughs, the team has to be small enough that it can be adequately fed by two pizzas. Small teams always move faster than big teams. One of the big mistakes we make inside large companies is we create a mini version of our large company when we're working on a new idea. There's a legal rep, and a quality rep, and a marketing rep, and a sales rep, and on and on and on. These teams never make any progress. We've all been there, right? 
we're sitting in meetings, in the first half of the meeting, we remember what we talked about at the last meeting. Then the legal rep gives their update, the marketing rep gives their update, you run out of time, you haven't solved any real problems. Most startup companies have two people in them, somebody to make the thing and somebody to sell the thing. And they're able to move faster and have more impact than large companies. Don't curse your efforts at the first mile by swarming them with resources. Keep the team lean and mean to try to encourage rapid learning. So that's the first acronym, DAP, Document, Evaluate, Focus, and Test. To use the second acronym, what I'm going to do is tell a very different story from a very different industry. The picture that you have on your screen here is the USS Nautilus. This is the world's first nuclear-powered submarine launched in 1954. Two countries have created nuclear submarine programs. The United States, which has basically had a pristine record with the technology despite all the uncertainties and risks involved, and Russia which has had all sorts of problems that we know about. Subs going missing, radioactive material leaked into the atmosphere, dozens of people losing their lives, and so on. What explains the difference? At least one explanation offered by Steve Spear in his excellent book, The High Velocity Edge, was the discipline that the leader of the US program brought to all of the uncertainty that characterized the idea. Every time they were doing anything, he asked the scientists to start with a hypothesis, just like good scientists should. The hypothesis should have objectives behind it. There should be a reason for the test that they're going to propose. He asked the scientists to make predictions. Even if they had no idea what the answer would be, come up with a prediction. The theory in this case is when you're forced to make a prediction, you begin in your brain to think about causality. That way, even if things don't conform to your expectations, you've created an opportunity to learn and improve the next time. Then when you go and execute, you execute in a way where you can test your prediction. As one example of this, as the scientists were creating the shielding that would go around the nuclear reactor, the head of the program said, tell me, what parts of the metal are going to fatigue the most? Make a prediction. Nobody had any idea. The science was simply too new. But by forcing people to make a prediction and then putting sensors in the shielding so you could execute in a way you could test that prediction, scientific understanding increased. You never know when you test, but if you have a hypothesis, you have objectives for your test, you make predictions, and you execute in the right way. If you have hope, then you can increase your ability to learn from the test that you're going to run. Let's go back to Medtronic for just a minute. So Medtronic went through the process that we talked about here. They executed a whole series of tests in market to try to address both the small and big areas of their idea. They piloted the Healthy Heart for All program in three hospitals across India. And from all the learning they got from it, they came up with a program that today has changed the face of heart treatment in India. This is the first customer of Healthy Heart for All, a woman named Angrabala. She was a widow who had household income of about $50 a month. She was fainting and having dizzy spells, and she didn't understand why. Once the doctors diagnosed her using one of the remote diagnostic camps, it was clear that she could benefit from a pacemaker. The loan program allowed her to access something that historically would have been too expensive. By following a systematic approach to removing the risk behind their very disruptive idea, Medtronic was able to speed through the first mile and help people like the woman pictured here. So remember, when you're approaching the uncertainty in innovation's first mile, and after I go through this slide here, I'm going to pause for questions. So feel free while I'm talking to type your questions in, and my team will get some of the best ones over to me here in Singapore. Remember, when you're going to the first mile in innovation, you always want to be deft, and you always want to have hope. Document, evaluate, focus, and test. And when you're testing, always have a hypothesis, create objectives, make predictions, and execute in ways that you can test your predictions. So I've got a, another chunk of material that we'll talk about, about how you do this inside a large company in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I am going to pause here for a few questions. I'm going to check some of the things that have come in from my team that's based in Boston right now. So hold on just one second. So this is one of the questions that I get asked most frequently. At what point does one know whether to continue tinkering with the new venture versus shutting down the firm? 
This honestly is one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have within the first mile. I call it the fog of innovation. The reality is every time you do anything, you're going to be able to say, well, there's a case to continue, there's a case to stop, and there's a case to course correct or, or pivot, as it's called in the lean startup movement. You're going to be able to make each of these arguments equally. So what do you do in the face of that uncertainty? Two things I suggest. First, make sure that you use checklists. Make sure that you go into anything that you're doing with a new idea with a checklist of the things that you need to see in order to continue to have optimism for the idea. Do that before you do anything. If you don't do that, then it'll be too easy, even when all the evidence is negative, to continue to move forward with the idea. The second thing that I suggest that you do is make sure you've got somebody who is a little disconnected from the idea providing advice as you're trying to decide what to do. Devil's advocates get a really bum rap when it comes to innovation, but the reality is having somebody making the case to do something different than what you want to do, having somebody who will look at things in a different sort of way is really helpful as you're trying to sort through what will almost always be inconclusive data. This is one of the hardest challenges you're going to face, but if you use the right checklist and you get the right people in the decision process, then it can help you make the best decisions that you possibly can. But it's never going to be perfect certainty. So recognize that it's better to make a decision where you're not 100% confident than just stall out and never make any progress at all. All right, I've got some other great questions here. I've got a couple questions about senior management support. I'll talk a little bit about some of the elements around doing this inside a large company in the next section. But one of the questions here is, how do you get people excited about funding and supporting innovation projects? One of the, the basic tips that I offer here is to do as much as you possibly can without asking for anything at all. I think inside many organizations, we feel like if we don't make the big ask to leadership, then we can't go and try anything. But here's the reality. In our venture investment arm in Singapore, what we're looking at these days is not really business plans. They're actually businesses. They're businesses where people have built websites, they've got customers, they even have early revenue. And they're looking for some support to scale up their businesses. These aren't things where people have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. In many cases, they've invested somewhere less than $1,000 to launch their idea. This is the reality of innovation in this day and age. You can get something started for almost nothing. So the number one thing that I would say to you if you're trying to get senior leadership excited about an idea is find a way to prove it. Go out there and do something to demonstrate that what you're thinking about meets the three tests that I talked about. There's a market need, you can do it, and the numbers are going to work. Even if it's a really small scale experiment, find ways to increase proof that you're actually moving in the right direction. All right, we have a few other questions that have come in, but I'm going to go through the next set of materials and hopefully give myself another couple minute window to pause to answer some more of the great questions that we've had here. The next thing that I want to talk about, which was something that a couple of you asked about, is how do I fight those antibodies inside my organization that are stopping me from doing this? Uh, what does that term mean there? This is something that my friend Dave Ulmer talked about in his recent book, The Innovator's Extinction. Every company has a core business, and the reality is when you're pushing the new and different, when you're moving in different ways, there are all sorts of systems inside your company that are hostile to your innovation, even if they don't mean to be so. As Dave described it, they're not really out to get you. What they're really trying to do is to protect your host. So what do you do in a situation like this when you know, even though you've got great capabilities, something about the way that you work might be holding you back? So let me illustrate this one with a, a case study as well. So the company I'm going to talk about here is Manila Water. Let me just give you a bit of background about Manila Water. The modern Manila Water was formed in 1997 when the government of the Philippines decided to privatize the provision of water services in Metro Manila. They split Manila into two parts, the west part and the east part. Manila Water got a license to operate in the east part. And at least one reason why they were privatizing it was a picture that you see on your screen here. Only about 26% of households in Metro Manila had reliable access to water. Well, over the course of the next 15 years or so, something magical happened. 
Manila water solved this problem. By 2013, almost 100% of households had reliable access to water that met all the key requirements that you would need to have cleanliness and net water loss and turbidity ratios and so on that you would see in many other parts of the world. Really a miraculous achievement. Here's the challenge that you have inside any company. Manila water did exactly what it was supposed to do, but the reward for victory is people say, what are you going to do next? Because the next wave of growth could not come simply from wiring or bringing water to more households in Manila. They had already solved that problem. So what do you do to more systematically pursue the new and different inside your organization? I'm going to suggest that doing this requires doing five things. First, make sure that you clearly define the new and different in your context. The reality is every business has at least two things it needs to do. Make today's business as strong as possible and create tomorrow's business. Innovation can help with both of these challenges. But when you're going and doing the new and different in the right side of the page, lots of things change. It might be a different customer. It might be new competitors. It might require new capabilities. It might require new business models. If you are not very clear inside your organization that the new and different is, in fact, new and different, it's very easy to get confused and not do anything that is actually new and different. So first, make sure you define the different types of innovation and you're clear to everyone what is special and unique about some of the new stuff you're going to do. The next thing you've got to do is direct those efforts in a strategic way. That means you're going to follow the guidance of Kennedy, not the guidance of Mao. What is Mao doing in this presentation? Well, in the 1950s, Mao launched a campaign in China that came to be known as the Hundreds of Flowers Campaign. The idea was to briefly open the regime up to dissent. You'd have artists, you'd have other political thought leaders come out and express their dissenting view. So anyone who has uttered the phrase, let's let hundreds or thousands of flowers bloom to try to spur new innovations, unintentionally perhaps, is channeling Chairman Mao. What do you think happened as a result of the hundreds of flowers campaign? Well, the reality was many of the dissenters got put in jail. Mao later went on to boast, we enticed the snakes out of their caves. In my experience, when you try to let hundreds of flowers bloom, the only thing you really get is a lot of dead flowers. So instead, you want to do what Kennedy did in 1961 in the picture here. This is from what became known as the moonshot speech. Kennedy committed to send a man to the moon and bring him back by the end of the decade. Obviously, this captures the heart. Obviously, it's visionary. But most importantly, it was credible. Before Kennedy gave this speech, he had Johnson look at all the technologies behind the space program to make sure this was something that actually could be done. You want to do the same thing for your new growth efforts. You want to have the equivalent of two or three moonshots, things that would have material impact that could actually be done so you can really direct your efforts in a strategic way. The next thing you've got to do is make sure once you've made those strategic choices, You've got resources to go and run them down. I apologize in advance. There are some limitations to this metaphor. It's not the greatest one in the world, but it's got some benefits as well. Two animals participated in the breakfast here. The chicken played a part, but the pig is committed. Far too many companies approach new innovations with a bunch of innovation chickens running around, trying to wreak havoc, spending 5 10% of their time working on efforts. This never works. Most startup businesses fail, and this is with somebody who's putting everything they've got into the creation of the business. For every new growth effort you have, you need to have at least one innovation pick. Now, hopefully, obviously, they don't die in the process, but you want somebody who is waking up every morning and going to sleep every night obsessing about their business. If you do not have that and you're trying to do something bold and different, you're trying to land a man on the moon, your chances of success are zero. So the first three things here begin to put you in the right direction. You've defined what the new and different means. You've directed it in a strategic way. You focus resources on it. But remember, the first mile is a perilous place. A lot of things aren't going to work. So the next question I want to ask some of the people on the webinar here is, when you've got something that, despite your best intentions, is falling short of commercial objectives, what do you do? 
Do you flood resources to try and make sure it succeeds? Do you tinker and tweak until you get it right? Do you shut it down and then penalize the team? Or do you shut it down and seek to get as much learning out of it as possible? We'd love to open this poll up to the people who are on the webinar and see what your own experience is here. Cast your votes now, and once we get enough, we'll show our results on the screen here, and I'll talk a little bit about what you do, in my experience, to manage this as best you can. Well, we've got an enlightened group here, so we've got only a few people that do the bad things, flooding it with resources, in many cases throwing good money after bad, only 8%. Shutting it down and terminating the team, I, I hope you're all being honest because unfortunately that's what happens in many cases, but only 6% of you said this. You've got one group that says we're going to keep at it, we're going to tinker and tweak until we get it right, and then another group that says we're going to do something that feels pretty bold inside most companies. We're actually going to stop and pull out as much learning as possible. Now these are in my mind the two answers that are acceptable, that you can either say there's still hope, let's keep going after it, or we're going to stop and extract learning. But this is not the way most people approach something that might feel like failure in innovation. This gets to the final two components of how you succeed in face of some of the corporate antibodies you face. Leaders have a huge role to play here. Their role has to be very different. In that little blue circle on the left side of the page I showed you a few pages ago where you're strengthening your core business, you're in an optimization role, like a good corporate planner. You're making annual decisions about how you're allocating resources. The group comes to consensus. If they can't, the senior leader breaks the tie. It's a numerical exercise, and you simply do not tolerate failure. This is very different from the disciplines that venture capitalists bring when they're trying to discover a new disruptive or breakthrough business. In this case, investment is staged to reduction in risk. The group might provide input, but many of the best investments by venture capitalists are actually quite polarizing, so an individual can champion them. You trust the person who's got the best experience, not the person who's most senior. Beyond the numbers, you look at the story and the team, and you expect there will be twists and turns on the path to success. In the 21st century, leaders have to be chameleons. They have to be able to be one way when they're in the blue space and optimizing today's business and think and act very differently when they're in the green space trying to discover tomorrow's business. That also means they have to play a critical role when they're nurturing an idea through the first mile of innovation. The metaphor that I'm going to use to cover this area, this is the last one here, provide a couple other thoughts about it, tell you what Manila Water did, and then move on to the last part of our discussion today. What, the metaphor I'm going to use here is how you evaluate people who are playing the three different games that are on the screen here if you're a senior leader. How do you evaluate whether somebody's good at roulette? It's a trick question. Nobody is good at roulette. Roulette is a game of pure chance. If somebody is smart, they do not play roulette. If you've got somebody in your organization that's doing the equivalent of roulette, they're taking stupid risks, they're doing things that are pure chance, you should punish them appropriately if they play those games. Those games are for people who are not very smart. You move over to the right side of the page in chess. How do you know somebody's good at chess? Well, all you have to do is look at the outcomes they achieve because chess is a game of almost pure skill. If you're in, some way, you're in an organization, you're trying to reward somebody who's playing a game like chess, like optimizing a known business, you reward the results they achieve. Blackjack is interesting. Blackjack is in between the two. Any given hand of blackjack does involve some skill. There are rules, there are patterns, there are things you can do to increase the odds, but it also involves luck. You can do everything right and still fail. You can do everything wrong and still succeed. Blackjack is like poker, it's like investing a stock, it's like hitting a baseball, it's like innovating in innovation's first mile. Anything that you do mixes luck and skill, which means instead of looking purely at the results, you have to look at the approach that people are following. This is a very different way to measure and reward people and a very different way to nurture nascent ideas. Now, unfortunately, inside many organizations, people don't do this. They only look at the commercial outcomes that people achieve. If you're in an organization like that, I am willing to make a prediction. 
if we were to come into your organization and say these are all the things you've got to do to more successfully innovate, you would say that sounds great, but we just don't have capacity to do this. You have the capacity. It's been sucked up by what I call the plague of the zombie projects, the walking undead, the efforts that if you are honest about them, will not really move the growth needle, will not really have the impact that you anticipate. But because everybody is so afraid of failing to achieve commercial objectives, they never raise their hands and say, you know what, this one isn't going to make it. We've got to put this one down. You've got to find different ways to solve the plague of zombie projects and make it clear that sometimes learning is a great outcome. Consider what Tata does in India. The team here is winning a prize called Dare to Try. This is a big deal within Tata. About 250 people applied for it in the last go-round. If you see the little red circle on the slide, it describes the reason the idea failed, the root cause of failure, what was learned, and the current status of the idea. You need to have the equivalent as well. You've got to dare to try, or it will be incredibly hard to succeed at innovation's first mile. Let me go back to Manila Water and describe how they put these five elements together. We call this the minimum viable innovation system, just enough to ward off those corporate antibodies and give you space to pursue the disruptive growth at innovation's first mile. How do they define innovation? They pick three different categories, things that optimize today's business, things that expand into new geographies, and then new service models that would push them in new markets. They directed the new service models in a couple or three big areas. In one example of this is treating the wastewater, the sewage and equivalent, that comes off of commercial businesses. Because the sewage system in Metro Manila isn't all that great, might there be a way to create a service that allows people to treat it? They focused. They appointed some pigs. You see some of their pictures here, Boogs, Robbie, and Sharon, and others, that were fully dedicated to the pursuit of growth. They led it in different ways. Not all of their senior leaders were involved, but a small group of senior leaders standing on a special committee to try to push these ideas in a new direction, and nurtured them by following very different approaches to appraise the work and appraise the people working on these efforts. By bringing these five things together, Manila Water created as strong a system as possible to block those corporate antibodies. So let me say one last thing on the leadership aspect of this, then I'll see if there are any last questions, and then I'll send everybody on their way. How do you get ready as an individual to approach the challenges of innovation's first mile? It is a tough challenge. As the great French poet Paul Valery said more than 70 years ago, the trouble with our times is the future is not what it used to be. Those words have never rung more true. We no sooner solve today's challenge that a new challenge emerges. Competitive lifespans are shrinking dramatically. The only thing I can predict with certainty is all of you in your careers will face challenges that none of us can anticipate. How do you get ready for that? Well, let me give you a couple lessons from something called the Marshmallow Challenge. This is from a great TED Talk from Ted Wujic, or Tom Wujic, I'm sorry, Tom Wujic, that also is reaffirmed with our own experience running this challenge here. If you haven't done it, it's really fun. You break people into teams, you give them the things that you've got on your screen here, and you tell them. In 18 minutes, build the highest freestanding structure that you can that's got a marshmallow on top of it. This has been done all around the world, and the average height that comes up is about 20 inches. Now, there's a group that reliably does worse than average on this. Interestingly, that is business school students. Why is this? Well, I've observed this time and time again. You get a bunch of business school students or recent graduates together. They spend the first six minutes establishing dominance, who's going to be the boss. They then come up with a very detailed plan for what they're going to do. They begin to build their tower. Then with a minute left, they triumphantly put the marshmallow on top, and the whole thing collapses. Their efforts to plan their way to success end up with disappointment. If business school graduates do poorly, what former graduates do well? Probably no surprise to any of you who have young children, but kindergarten graduates actually do exceedingly well at this task because they don't filter. They just, just go and try things. They experiment, they iterate to try to find a path to success. And by doing so, they come up with very inventive solutions that are far better than the average performance. First lesson here, this is innate in all of us. Creativity and innovation used to be in every one of you, 
but we systematically unlearn it. How do you bring it back? Adopt what Zen masters would call a beginner's mind. Put yourself purposefully in a situation where you do not know the answer. Maybe that's an assignment at work that's really different than what you've done before, a new geography, a new product launch. Maybe it's something outside of work where you pick up a new skill, language, or musical instrument. You force yourself to go back to that early stage and release the creativity that's in all of you. Here's a second interesting finding. CEOs do a little bit better than average, but you pair them with their executive admin and the score shoots up. Magic happens at intersections where different mindsets, approaches, and skills collide. This is true of any study about innovation. So what you want to do is find ways to make sure you live at intersections have as diverse an innovation network as possible. We're taught to innovate with people who look like us, who act like us, who went to our schools. But instead, you want to consciously have diversity all throughout your innovation network. Here's a simple tip that you can put into action as soon as this webinar is over. Find the aliens in your organization. They exist. These are the people who make kind of the weird comments at meetings, who eat lunch by themselves, who you look at kind of strangely. Go find the aliens in your organization and give them a big, bad hug. When you're working on an innovation problem, they're the ones who can push you in a different direction. Hug your aliens and prepare yourself to lead in the challenges that we cannot anticipate that we will face tomorrow. So we've got just a couple minutes left here. I'm going to see Kathy if I've got any other great questions here. And I'll take maybe two of them, provide one last slide, and end maybe in one minute over time, but no more than that. All right, I got a question here. Does depth and hope apply equally well to product innovation, particularly when you've not done prototypes? Uh, I think the process here is meant to be a scientific way to address the uncertainty that exists behind any strategy. So depth and hope, in my experience, in our experience, applies to everything because it's a principle of how you deal with uncertainty. So I think you can do it no matter what circumstance you're in. Obviously, the specific way you do it will differ depending on the context. I would say that prototyping is something that can be used, in my experience, everywhere. It doesn't mean that you've got to create an expensive prototype. You can do it with everyday materials. You can do a drawing. If you're in a service space, you can do a cartoon that shows how people will experience your service. Find simple ways to do it in order to try to learn more about your idea. We've got a great question here. Fear of failure is a big stumbling block to getting people to fully commit to a project. How do you overcome this and build trust that the project will work? Well, first thing you have to recognize is going with your eyes wide open. It is very possible, if not plausible, that it will not work. Remember, when you're at the early stages of innovation, you don't know what the right answer is. And it's possible that it turns out that you make good assumptions and good hypotheses, and you'll just be wrong. In my mind, this means that you completely reframe what success looks like. Rita McGrath from Columbia, I think, does the best writing on this topic. And the way she describes it, any time you innovate, two good things can happen. Either you can have a commercial success, or you can learn something that prepares you for the next commercial success. If you're standing at the first mile of innovation and you don't know if your idea is good or not, the only failure is spending too much time or spending too much money learning. If you drill that into people's head in the beginning, then it can make people understand that it is a journey of learning. And the results might not come with this one, but at the very least, you'll learn something that will help other people in the organization. There's a lot more about this topic. I would recommend those who are interested check out some of the things that Rita has written. So I'll take one last question here, and then I'll provide my last slide of thoughts. If you could, do one, if you could only conduct a few of the experiments from the experiment cookbook that's in the, the first mile, how do you choose? Well, in my mind, it's pretty simple. You go to the first mile certainty table, and you ask yourself, where do I have the biggest angst? Where do I have the biggest uncertainty? Then you ask yourself, how much time do I have? How much money do I have? With that, you're able to determine what area I ought to focus on, and then what's the experiment in the cookbook where I can learn the most. There are a ton of things you can do that can increase your knowledge in just a few hours. A simple thing can be a thought experiment. Put yourself in the shoes of the competitors and think how they'll respond to your idea. Or imagine a customer or a stakeholder who is seeing your idea for the first time. You put yourself in these perspectives. You can learn a ton without spending any time and money. And again, there's more information in the book. 
All right, well, we've covered a pretty wide ground in our hour here together. I, I want to end as close to on time as possible, so this is the last content slide that I'll give you. The next slide has all my contact information as well. I want to close by providing six final pieces of advice about how you can approach innovation's first mile. First, be humble. Recognize when you're innovating, you know a little and you're assuming a lot. You don't want to fall prey to false confidence. Make sure you understand how little you really know as you start to innovate and do new things. Be thorough. Pick up your idea and describe it as well as you possibly can. Take the time to document it. Look at, look at it from multiple perspectives to make sure you don't miss something critical. Be innovative. What's your wind tunnel? If the Wright brothers could use that simple way to test their assumptions and you can launch a business today for less than $1,000, what can you do to learn more without spending a huge amount of time and money? Be active. If you want to make steel strong, you forge it at a temperature that approximates 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to make your idea strong, you've got to learn in the market, with the market, and from the market. Be flexible. Embrace your inner MacGyver. Your idea is wrong. Don't build up too many fixed costs because that will make it impossible for you to change course as you learn how your idea is wrong. Finally, and most importantly, be bold. There are a lot of great big problems in the world today that demand our very best innovation energy. The first mile can indeed be a perilous place, but if you follow the guidance in this webinar, you can approach it with more confidence, you can increase your odds of success, you can dramatically increase your pace and effectiveness of learning. I hope you found this to be helpful. You can see some information about how to find my organization and me on the final page of our presentation. You've got Insight's website, my email address, the companion website for the book, my Twitter feed, and then the blog that I write over at harvardbusinessreview.org. Thank you very much for joining, and good luck in your efforts to plow through the first mile of innovation. Have a good day.